know if I'll ever co fully convert over to the new title, um, but I'm starting it chuckling because Lauren Spreiser is here with us and I got to watch her while the countdown was happening. A lot happened. <laughs> I think like the camera was everywhere. The ring light was everywhere, but in typical Lauren fashion, had I not said that, we go live and she is like in a studio environment, like nothing Shit, ever happened. Totally together. <laughs> so it's an as, illusion. <laughs> it's an illusion. Um, as you all know, Lauren is a Grand Prix dressage rider and a phenomenal standout ride IQ coach. And we're so happy to have her with us here today. We're talking about how some tips to get you to your personal best dressage score. So like, of course, Lauren, from a coach's perspective and a trainer's perspective, like training the horse, coaching the student has some insight that can really help us make the most of our time in the arena. But just, well, first of all, Lauren, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. It was also kind of last minute. So we really appreciate you making the time. The, the time worked out well with the exception of the juggling of the computer and the ring light. So we're good. You made it all work. Well, my first question is you and Kinsey were in the green room and I came into the conversation and what I heard was something about a light amount of mayonnaise. So do you have a recipe to share with us or what, what were you and Kinsey chatting about before I joined the conversation? Uh, the reader's digest version of what Kinsey and I were talking about when y'all walked in was that I uh, have dinner assembled, but not made obviously. Um, and I am grilling tonight. I'm grilling um, <clears throat> chicken and vegetable skewers. And whenever I grill, I coat the thing I'm going to grill in a light layer of mayonnaise because mayonnaise is an emulsion uh, and oil or grease is an oil. Uh, and emulsions do a better job of keeping things from sticking to your grill, which makes them taste a lot better. But also it is intensely satisfying to live with a spouse who swears that he doesn't like mayonnaise and you know that you've been feeding it to him on everything he's ever eaten that you've grilled for him for years. And he doesn't know. So hopefully he doesn't watch this. Otherwise, surprise, <laughs> poisoned <laughs> with mayonnaise for like five years now and you haven't died. We are starting off the show. I mean, you guys, that's a life pro tip that we already got from Lauren. Um, I'm not the griller in our family unit, but I will pass it on to the griller. <laughs> And Kinsey, are you the griller in your family unit? I wouldn't say so, no. But yeah, also noted. Good to know. Now you're for prepared. Sure. Now you're prepared. Yeah. We'll give it a try. Um, well, Lauren, before we jump into all things maximizing your dressage test scores, I know that since we talked to you last, you've moved back to Virginia. So tell us, give us kind of a life update. How's Virginia? What's your <laughs> program like these days? A day in the life of Lauren? Fill us in. Oh, God. Um, I, yes, we've been back in Virginia. I don't even know what day is it? May 10th. So we've been back in Virginia for about a month. Um, I have been home maybe one of those weekends. Uh, we, we, well, um, we made it. We survived the Florida winter. Uh, and now there gets to be, there, there got to be like a minute of breathing um, before the chaos descended. I, the chaos never stops descending for me. I've taught clinics. I've traveled. Uh, my mayonnaise poisoned husband and I have celebrated our first wedding anniversary. Um, and we went away for a brief weekend. And then let's see, I've got horse show, horse show, clinic, clinic, horse show, clinic. I think I'm home at some point in there, maybe. I don't is know. this f the forthcoming schedule or the schedule that you just lived? Schedule coming. Uh, okay. I don't even know what's in my rear view mirror. Like there's still one suitcase that's not unpacked. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. And for someone who really has her shit pretty together, this is like very not together. Um, I'm wearing my pajama bottoms right now. And this definitely doesn't have room in it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, well, I'm also wearing pajama bottoms and this definitely doesn't have red wine in it. <laughs> so you, I mean, I think we're doing great. And I, yes. yeah, cheers. I think this is a nice time to like relax and chat and catch up. Um, I made it till five. Like it's fun. Yeah. I'm it's on fun. East coast time too. Hey. Just, just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> um, but, and I generally don't have a glass of wine with ask an expert, but I, I, I feel like 
I mean, I tell everyone this, I feel like we are like true friends because listening to your lessons and hack chats, how could you not feel like that? So this is girls night <laughs> and, um, just the right amount too. So that there's work to be done after, sure. but happy to start happy wedding anniversary. That's, I feel like your wedding to me, it feels like it was yesterday. Uh, I feel like we stopped paying the bills on it like yesterday. Yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> for, for anyone who has like, maybe you weren't a Facebook friend or Instagram follower of Lauren last year at this time, but Lauren's wedding dress was like the most, and your whole wedding, the most beautiful out of a magazine, like really fun pictures to look at. So you can probably go back in the archives and take a look at those. Uh, can I, can I give a shout out to the reason, one of the reasons why my wedding was so amazing. And that is because my wedding planner was a dressage writer named Jessica Maskell and she's the tits not only because she's just an awesome person but also she's a dressage rider and like we should be planning your shit wow so her day job is as a wedding planner and she's like an adult amateur rider yep uh, she actually has a real day job her her side hustle is wedding planner um and her amateur hobby is dressage rider so she does, does it all. Though. She does she does do it all. Where does she awesome. have the time? That's a lot. I don't know, but she's incredible. <laughs> um that's amazing. Well, we will be thinking about you as you embark on this. I mean, you've already embarked on it. Your life has been a lot of clinics and shows. This um, is not new. <laughs> but people is is there one central spot that you keep your like is are most of your clinics on Strider or how could people figure out what your clinic plan is? Oh, Just God, they're everywhere. Um near I, to the I, ground. Yeah, I think I, I, if you want to know if I'm coming to your area, I think the answer right now is to email me because they're they're everywhere. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a document on my computer called Where is Lauren? Uh, actually, there's a Google document called Where is Lauren? Because sometimes I don't know. Uh, and my husband and my barn manager and my assistant trainer all have access to it. Um, but yeah, let's see. Places I go. I go to Austin, Texas. I go to Vermont. I go to Connecticut. I go to um little rock arkansas i go to ottawa canada there's more so and if, someone wants, if, if someone wants to audit one of those clinics would they they, they talk to the clinic organizer okay. which uh eventually my ducks will be in a row enough to put like a master list out i think as a matter of fact there has been an email sitting in my drafts folder uh to send to my amazing social media wizard kim about like, hey, we should probably publish this list at some point. And I think it's been there for a month. So then I mentioned that there's one Florida suitcase. It's not unpacked yet. <laughs> yeah, we, we I mean, ducks, ducks are never going to be perfectly in a row. But nope. that's another I mean, it's been on Kinsey and my list as well to like have a master clinic spreadsheet of all of our ride IQ coaches and their whereabouts. But I mean, you know, our ducks are kind of <laughs> oh, are you guys busy? Yeah, <laughs> but it's all good. And yes, sh guess. shout out to Kim. She's wonderful. Um, we get to watch her be great from afar. Um, okay, one last question on your life today, and then we will get right into it. Um, what is your farm in Virginia similar to your farm in Florida? Do you have like, how many horses do you have there? Do you have more clients in Virginia? more students in Virginia. Is it very similar in both these places? How many horses do I have? Hang on. There's a list. There's 17 right now. The fact that I had to look at my phone to tell you how many horses there are is like, nah. um, so in, in Florida, there's sort of the same number between 15 and, and 20 at any particular time. Um, but in Virginia, I do a lot of short-term business. Uh, certainly, I have my full training clients, but I also have clients who keep their horses at home or keep their horses at a boarding stable, and they send them for a period of time. Um, I know for a fact that I'm going to be up to like 23 for a minute in in end of May, beginning of June, because I have clients that are traveling and sending me their horses and clients that are trying to fix the ones, and so they're sending me their horse, and it's just, it's just sort of one of those times um, and that's something that we do a lot more of in Virginia than we do in Florida, most beca mostly because coming to Wellington for a short period of time is really hard for a lot of people to to make happen. Um, although I think it's getting easier. I think that there's more short term rentals available and Airbnb has really changed that. And we could have a whole a whole <laughs> chat about this. Um, what I'm really excited about is that this is the first time in years where every horse that I own is in one Barn. It is in one building. Uh, my foal is now four and she's under saddle and she's at home. 
Um, and the new one, Cadeau, arrived from Denmark like two weeks ago. So everything I own is in one place, which is amazing. So I get to pet it. I get to pet all of them every day. That is amazing. And the full, that's Lala, right? That's Lala. Yep. Okay. She's four now. Yeah. That Lala, we're excited to follow along more with Lala and Kado. I've seen like three pictures oh. and somehow I'm already in love with him. <laughs> oh, me too, man. Me too. Like love. It's everything I've ever wanted in a horse. So I'm sure I'll find some way to screw it up. It's fine. No, you won't. That's I was on, I told you I was on a call with um your working student prior to this. And I was like, how is Kado? And her face was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, I mean, he's really cute. I you didn't ask about your boyfriend. Wondering how he's doing. Puck, your boyfriend's doing great. Actually, you probably shouldn't. I probably I should feel bad about that. <laughs> Number one in my heart. How is Puck? Puck is great. Puck is doing his second Grand Prix this weekend. Thoughts and prayers. That's exciting. Um, yes, not thoughts and prayers, but excited for <laughs> no, you he's doing good vibes. That's a joke. Puck. He's doing awesome. Puck, is I great. know your boyfriend is doing well in your absence. Good. Um, Okay, now on to the task at hand, getting our best dressage scores. Let's start by focusing on riders who are at like low to mid levels. It, as a coach, if you had a student come in who, um, you know, needed to kind of like go from good to great in the dressage arena, or if, if you, even if you were clinic, clinicking with people at this level, are there any go-to exercises that you have for people that kind of need to check the box, whether that's like working on sharp transitions or cadence, or I'm sure that you have a whole toolbox of these, but how do you kind of think of those foundational exercises that might contribute to an overall better score in a test? I'm going to reject the premise of your of your question. And here's why you Good said, <laughs> you said, you bet, because you said, if I was working with somebody at the low levels, what would I do to work on the foundation? Guys, the foundation is everything. I don't care if you're coming to me for your first intro A or your first, your hundredth Grand Prix special, the transitions are everything. The crispness and the organization of the work is everything. Um, so, so let me sort of pivot that. How do you pick the level you're, you're gonna come out and show at? What work feels relatively, relatively easily, uh, that, that comes easily to you? Um, if I'm practicing, I've, if I've got a, a horse that's that's sort of in that training for a second ish level range, that on a good day it's one of those, and on a bad day I can't turn, I say, okay, are more of the days days when I can do my test, or are more of the days days where I sometimes need a second shot at my test? If more of the days feel doable, then you go to the horse show at that level. Uh, Maddie right now is six. On a good day second level feels doable. On a bad day, second level is nowhere near doable. There are more days where it's a reach than there are days that it's easy. So we're going and doing first level. Never mind that I can half pass this horse that I'm working on, you know, making small canter towards a canter pirouette with this horse. Second level isn't consistent enough for me to go out and do that level. I also hate second level, but that's neither here nor there. So I'm going to go show first level in two weeks. It's going to be wildly beneath this horse's capabilities. And I don't care because it is a test that I can sort of release into existence instead of make into existence. And I don't care whether it's Walk Trot or the Grand Prix. If you feel like you're having to like say a little prayer before you put on your coat, maybe you're not ready to do the level you're, you're thinking of. So let's say that you've picked the correct level, whether it's walk trot or Grand Prix or anywhere in between. I want to feel like I don't have to have the right color underwear on to do anything in that test. That I want to be able to prepare in each corner, prepare on each short, short side, and release whatever movement comes next. If that's training level, then I want to feel like I can look to my next letter, you know, 10 meters before I hit the, the letter that I'm going to be leaving the wall at and get beautifully across the diagonal. I want to be able to start my 20 meter circle thinking about 10 strides from now. I want to be able to start my canter transition thinking about 10 strides from now. If I'm doing Grand Prix, I want to be thinking about three movements from now and preparing that in the corner and everywhere in between falls somewhere on that spectrum. But transitions, corners, and feeling, feeling like you can prepare the movement and then release it 
rather than like, oh, God, I'm getting her done and holding her together. So for perfecting the transitions between the gates, is the best plan- is the best way to do that at home, just doing several of them, like just quantity of transitions? It's a numbers game. It's it's about doing them over and over and over again. Uh, we mentioned Cadeau. Cadeau is seven uh, in in Denmark before he came over. Obviously, the trip is a bitch, and and you know he lost some weight and he's lost some condition. But with a with a gun to my head, when I tried him in Denmark, I could have shown him like fourth level test one would have been fairly easy. The pre Saint George, I probably could have pulled it off. If that thing goes to a horse show, it's going to be at third level because I'm spending my life right now doing trot canter transitions, walk trot transitions over and over and over and over and over until I feel like they are very consistently the way that I want them. Is that a little boring? Yeah. Is dressage a little boring? Sometimes. But that's that's going to the gym. Transitions are going to the gym. Half halts are going to the gym. And I could go to the gym and I could pick up a 100-pound weight one time. Or I could pick up a 5-pound weight 100 times. And I'm going to be way stronger for that more consistent small effort. And I'm less likely to get hurt, or obviously in this metaphor, hurt my horse, by doing lots of little boring things. Rather than like, oh, I'm going to pound out the big hairy movements a handful of times. Jess, I have a follow-up. Okay. <laughs> I saw that. Is, is there a most common mistake that you see people make in their transitions between the gates? Pulling. Pulling or, or saying like, okay, I am at, I'm one stride before C and the transition is at C. Bam. Everything starts... 10 strides ahead, 20 strides ahead, you need to be at least thinking about what comes next so much farther in advance than you think you need to be. And, and uh, uh, this comes from years of doing this, but my winter sort of gift to myself was getting to sit and watch the really good Grand Prix riders at Global every weekend because I never get to do that. Um, and the difference between the top group and the middle group was that the top group it just looked like they were allowing it to happen, which meant that they were thinking about it 20 strides before. So if you have a student who doesn't have crisp transitions in your lessons, what would you say, like, this is what you should do between today, Tuesday, and next Tuesday when I see you? Park your cute little behind on a 20 meter circle and just do them, do them, do them. Um, we have we have an exercise at my house, which I call the devil's play thing, which is a transition every six strides. So six strides a walk, six strides a trot, six strides a canter. Six, 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 you get it? <laughs> Got um, it. <laughs> thank you. And it doesn't have to be six. If six is varsity level for you, then every quarter of a circle, every third of a circle, every time you hit a letter, whatever it needs to be to make it happen. But the repetition is, is an asset. Um, one of the things that I hear most from my own students when I'm on their case about also you have to practice your tests is, well, my horse is learning the test. He knows the things in advance. Then you're not preparing it well. <laughs> then you're not preparing him so that he, you're, you're asking your horse every step. Are you with me? Yes. Great. Are you with me? Yes. Great. Are you with me? Yes. Great. It's a constant, small conversation. And yeah, if I'm seeing a student on Tuesday and the horse shows on Friday and they're not ready, I'm going to tell them not to go. Uh, or I'm going to tell them to be prepared for it to not go very well. And let's, let's be clear, in a conversation about showing, your preparation for the Olympics and your preparation for the local schooling show are probably going to look a little different because blowing it at the local schooling show is very much par for the course. I have blown on purpose many a schooling show ride. I have even blown many a recognized show ride. So your definition of success certainly has to play a role in this. If you're a nervous person, then getting down center line at all, like, yeah, you, that's amazing. Um, but if it's, if you're really far off, you don't have to go. There's no rule. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask two questions in a row. <laughs> sure. You mentioned the student coming down center line and like, it's a win if they go down center line, because that's a step in the right direction toward like, you know, they were nervous to do it and they're doing it. Um, in the arena nerves are, 
do you have any recommendations for riders who like you see them either at home or even in warm up and they look like themselves and then they get in front of the judge and they don't look like themselves anymore? What are do you have words of wisdom for that sort of like mental block that some people have? Ah, uh, it's called horse show brain and it happens to all of us. Don't feel bad. Um let me let me tell you a story. Uh when Elvis was 9, uh Elvis my, my last really super Grand Prix horse who I just sold to make room for Cadeau in my life. Um, it wasn't quite that simple, but that's it. Um, Elvis was a good show horse. Elvis was a show horse long before I met him and was very, very good at it, but also a little wise uh, and a little cheeky. Um, and he was nine and we were starting to compete at the international level. And he was the regional champion at eight. He could have been national champion at eight. I broke my hand. We couldn't go to the national championships, but he was like, good. He was ready for this. And we went to our first CDI and we're warming up and out of nowhere, he stands on his hind legs. I mean, vertical. I've got a great picture of it. I am hanging around his neck. It is so vertical and like brain totally gone. I kind of get it together. We go in the ring. We get like a 62 or something. And I know there's a lot of people going, oh, I'd be thrilled with a 62. Guys, this is a 70% horse. Like 62 is embarrassing. And I came out of the arena and a friend of mine is there. Her name is Olivia Lagoy Welts. She's a team member. She's an international Grand Prix rider. And she, we don't know each other super well at this point, enough to say hello. And she looks at me and she says, do you like pedicures? And I said, I do. And she said, great, put your horse away. We're going. And Olivia Lagoy Welts, team member, and I got pedicures and she regaled me with stories of famous people having absolute train wrecks in the arena in public at a high performance level, people getting eliminated, people not even making it down center line, people forgetting their tests at the European championships. Remember this, it's all just circles in the freaking sand. You're gonna blow some. You're gonna get good scores that you absolutely don't deserve. You're gonna have the ride of your life and you're gonna get screwed with your pants on and everything in between. And ultimately it's just circles in the sand. And so when I have people that are nervous, um, I, have a, I have a list on my phone of jokes. I'm happy to share some of them with you uh, that I save for horse shows because they're terrible and, and generally universally good to get a laugh. Um, and then yeah, you have to practice. You have to go and practice. If you are lucky enough to have a budget that lets you practice at a lot of recognized shows, great, good for you. If you don't, then you have to be crafty about where you go and practice. You have to go to schooling shows. You have to turn up at your neighbor's farm. You have to go to your coach, go to your coach's coach, go to your coach's buddy. We do all kinds of wacky things. Uh, Elvis, like I mentioned, likes to occasionally get a little bit of a cheeky streak at the horse shows. Not fortunately that cheeky ever again, which was awesome. Um, but I would braid him, put on a tailcoat and go ride at other people's farm. So I would just pull up and do it and trick him <laughs> into not riding like a dork and trick me into not riding like a dork until we got really good at it. So practice, 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 practice. And remembering that margaritas and or ice cream cure almost everything we have the same taste. <laughs> um, that's interesting because I, yeah, I hadn't thought about like, we've of course heard the suggestion, like get your horse out often. And especially if you have the opportunity to get them out when they're young, like expose them to things, desensitize them to things. But I hadn't thought of the human side of that too, which oh is God. for sure part of it, especially when you watch your saw shows, like that's the element that you see more often than not kind of being like, very different at the horse show you know the human is experiencing I, honestly the horses are very rarely the problem <laughs> uh for sure like i do this for a living and i am usually the problem um so it's actually pretty unusual when i throw a horse under the bus um and they're also easier to fix they're easier to train they're the humans are awful to train my god i'm so glad that i train animals they're much easier yeah, I feel like you you inadvert you you do train humans though. Like you're training because you've you've got all those students. Like you, yes. yeah. So I hate to break it to you, Lauren, but I you know. love humans. They're great. <laughs> you're too good at it. Um, okay, so are with like the the show in mind? Are there any things that you 
like just kind of general do's and don'ts that you see happen. Let's start with the don'ts because they're more interesting. Let's any don'ts that you see people do in the ring or even just like in warm up that you think um, are not benefiting them with their score at the end of the day. Don't change your tack before the show. The number of people I have that are like, hang on, I've put my show bridle together wrong. What do you mean your show bridle? Have one bridle. Make it a nice one. Take good care of it. And then don't change it before the horse show. Because what if you put it together wrong? And what if you don't know that it's wrong until you're in the warm-up arena? You want to ask me how often this happens? Don't have show stirrup irons don't have you can have a show saddle pad that's fine but i'd make sure that it's a type that you've used before or that you've at least practiced with and on that note like yes obviously we don't you know practice in white breeches and show coats very often but i make sure that the brand of my show breeches the model the make and model of my show breeches is a make and model that i'm familiar with most show breeches white breeches also are made in other colors. So like for me, I ride at home in the Romp Isabella to make sure that I also like the Romp Isabella when I go to horse shows. The first time I show a horse at FEI, I practice at home in my tailcoat because for some of them, the first time those shad belly tails flap, they go and exit stage left. Don't forget to practice with those things. Um, Don't change your warmup. Do practice your warmup. Everybody, no. Not everybody. Some people are good at practicing their tests. You all should be good at practicing your tests. But not everybody's good at remembering to practice the warm-up. And for the love of all that's holy, you don't need 45 minutes to warm up your horse. You simply do not. In my entire career, which is long and annoying, I have had one horse that maybe needed like half an hour on the first day because he was bananas. But I 20 minutes is kind of my my normal. You don't need to walk your horse for half an hour before you go to the warm up. If you don't need to walk your horse for half an hour before you go to the warm up at home, yes, horses are often more excited at the horse show, but not 30 minutes more excited. And if they are, then that's a sign that you need to go to more horse shows, not a sign that you need to warm your horse up for an hour and a half. I know of no one who is good at this who warms up a horse for more than 35 minutes. I just, I just don't, I've never met that person. I like that. Um, on, I mean, there's so many questions that I have. I was going to say on that same note, do you have any pet peeves? And the reason that it, pet peeves at the horse show, a pet peeve of mine is when people talk exclusively about like what the judge said versus what, versus sharing how their test went, just how it went. And, and presenting it in a way that like the judge, the judge said this and, and suggesting like that was wrong in every way. I just like to hear like how to go. (laughs) Um, I think for sure that is, that is certainly a little, a little cumbersome. Um, I, I am quick to defend judges because if you've never sat at sea, it's really interesting. They know you for six minutes. They, you know, we don't go down center line with a note pinned to our show jacket like Paddington Bear that says like, hey, here's my story. You know, you don't know that I'm terrified and this horse was a sketchy bastard for years and the fact that I'm here is a Christmas miracle. Um, You know, the judge doesn't know that you're having the worst day of your life. The judge doesn't know that you're having the worst ride of your life. Um, The judge doesn't know that your horse is barely sound and this is your last shot before the horse goes to retirement. Like, you have to understand that judges don't know those things. They're judging the six minutes in front of them. Um, and they're humans. Sometimes they blow it just like we sometimes blow it. Um, very rarely do I bitch about judging. Cause I think it's a super hard job. And I also know that over your lifetime, the number of times that you get gifts and the number of times that you get screwed roughly even out, they're just rarely instant. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't love people who harp on judges. My personal pet peeve is people who go back to the warm-up after their test to like fix something. As if your horse with a goldfish brain is going to connect those two things. If you've blown it in the ring, whatever it is, it's probably not going to be the sort of situation where your horse is like, well, 
now that my mommy's taken me back to the warm up and kicked the crap out of me for 20 more minutes, now I know to never do that in the in the show ring ever again. The moment's over. Go back to the barn. Try again. It's okay. That's really good advice. I am glad that yeah, that's I'm glad you said that because I completely agree with that sentiment. Um what about things that you do? Is there anything that you've ever done yourself or you've had a student do in the ring that was like an easy easy way to just get more get a better score or get get a better like I don't know like I like anything where you're like wow that really unlocked just a better score and I didn't I didn't even realize it was like an issue is that too bad of a question uh we'll make it work breathe guys (laughs) breathe 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 through it just keep breathing because things are gonna not go according to plan we plan god laughs breathing is gonna solve more of your problems than you can possibly know um and memorize your test can i can i just like rail for a second about memorizing your tests because everyone thinks that i'm the super nice person that i'm nice and funny all the time Listen, people who make excuses for not being able to memorize a test are up there with me about people who don't replace toilet paper rolls and people who don't put shopping carts back. Memorize your freaking tests. I have had students with traumatic brain injuries memorize the dressage test. I have had people with, with uh, uh, oh my God, the inability to, to read because the letters look backwards. Dyslexia. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, clearly, it's going really well for me. <laughs> memorize your tests. The dressage test. I'm a dressage trainer. Like, this is the only thing that I know about. I have no opinion on whether people can memorize jump courses or not. But we are given the answers to the test in advance. If you are a person that struggles to memorize things, start earlier. Don't make excuses. You can do it. I know people dumber than you who have figured out how to do it. Do it. Okay. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Okay. I have a follow-up on that. And um, I'm sorry, Joseph, you also had a follow-up. But okay. When you're memorizing your tests, how are you, are you paying attention and should you be paying attention to the different boxes? Like, should I care that within one box, there's two movements and the next box, there's one movement? Like, should that matter to me? Or because I, yeah. Yes. End of question. That's great. So the, uh, that's a great question. So the answer is absolutely. For example, in the pre-St. George, which I know is a level that a lot of people can't fathom, but roll with me here in the pre-St. George you come across a diagonal and you make a canter pirouette. That is one score. You then counter canter back to a flying change at C. That is another score. Let's say on the canter pirouette, your horse steals the flying change and ends up on the wrong lead. Stop, regroup, pick up the lead you're supposed to be on and do the flying change at C. Because if you just do a drive-by, if you're like, oopsie poopsie, my horse is on the lead for the next movement, like I'm just gonna kick on, Congratulations, you've earned a crappy score for the pirouette and you've earned a shelf of zero for the flying change. That's a hugely expensive thing. Stop, regroup, fix it. If only because it's going to give your horse a learning opportunity of like ah, instant, like, whoa, regroup, start over. Um, but also because you're then going to get a score for your flying change. And that's the only one that comes to, there's one in the junior team test too, because I have a kid who, who, lost a medal at the junior team championships because she didn't do the flying change. And this is the only two examples that come to mind, but I am sure that there are more. I'm sure there are examples at training level, first level and second level too, where like, don't take the hidden two movements, triage <laughs> and, and do limit the damage to one movement with that said, I'll throw scores away too. Um, the, there's, a a medium canner a lengthened canner excuse me at first level test three there is a very real possibility that when i show that thing next week on maddie my six-year-old we may or may not come back on the right lead because right now it's working about 60 percent of the time at home so there's going to be a little jesus take the wheel and i'm not worried about it um if she comes back gravy if she doesn't i'm gonna stop I'm going to come to a dead halt in the middle of this length and canter on the right lead. And I'm going to start over again. Am I going to take a hit for that? Absolutely. But I'm going to do damage control. I'm going to have an organized canter by the time I'm ready for the next movement. Even if it means that I take a two, even if it means that I get a nasty gram from the judge, which has happened before too, like I'm going to train my horse. I'm not going to do it meanly, but I am going to train my horse. 
it's pretty cool too that like just to have the there's a possibility this will happen and this yeah. is how i'm going to react like as part of not not i mean part of the memorization but just part of the plan like this could happen and if it does this will be my re reaction um that is that that is a point i haven't hadn't gotten to before <laughs> um and it's a muscle for sure. Like, I, we're not going to talk about how old I am, but I've been doing this for almost 30 years. And I feel like I got good at it about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and I've ridden a bajillion tests and, and only, uh, truly only within the last couple of, couple of years, really at any level, have I felt like, okay, I have time to take a breath in between each thing that I do instead of being like, ah, movement, 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 movement. Um, and having a contingency plan for options A, B, C, and D that may go askance is certainly something that I think about when I'm memorizing my own tests. Um, but they always find a way to surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> and having the presence of mind, this comes back to the breathing thing of just being like, Okay, kick on. And it's it's something that just takes some practice. You're going to have to log some miles. Yeah. And that breathing helps you have an opportunity to make a good choice when yeah. you're a little bit surprised. We've talked a lot about memorizing your tests and practicing your tests. As far as practicing goes, like are you are you recommending to your students at the end of each schooling ride run through your whole test or run through the part of your test that you're wanting to polish a little bit more. Is there any amount that you're like, okay, we've overdone it. And now both you and your horse are not benefiting from the additional repetition. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about it. Um, certainly it's not hard to go through a training or first level test when you get to second, third, fourth beyond, it's pretty hard to like go through it and then also break it down and go back and do anything else that you're going to do again. Uh, uh, Jess's boyfriend Puck is doing his show at Grand Prix this weekend. I went through the whole Grand Prix test maybe a week ago. I think I had a lesson with, I had a virtual lesson with my coach a week ago and we went through the whole thing. Um, since then and before then, I was doing bits and pieces. I was doing A down center line, turn, trot work, P off passage, walk, P off passage. Okay, cool. Or like, okay, canter, do the thing, do the thing, do the thing, P off passage, done. Um, particularly as you go up the levels, I think you're going to find it better to sort of chunk things together rather than like, I'm going to do the whole thing every day for a week, but there's no right or wrong answer. No, the wrong answer is to not do it. The right answer is what feels right for you and for your horse. Um, I am horse showing on Saturday. Today is Wednesday. Tomorrow, Puck and I are going for a walk. Could I practice the test again? Sure. But then I'll run out of horse on Sunday. And I also want him to be happy with the world and it's going to be a gorgeous day tomorrow. So we're going to go hack and we're going to eat grass and I'm going to tell him how much I love him. And is that going to make a difference in his mind? I don't know. He's got like four brain cells. What do I care? Um, but it's going to make a difference in my mind. And certainly it's going to leave me with plenty of horse for Sunday. And I, I think that you have to know your animal a little bit. You have to know you a little bit. Um, this is where it's really nice to have a coach who also knows you. I feel like I spend more of my time as a trainer keeping people off their horses <laughs> than I do having them get on their horses. So if you're thinking, oh, just one more time, maybe don't. Yeah, maybe that's don't. really interesting. I have I have a couple. Well, one, your plan tomorrow sounds glorious. And Kara in the chat just said the same. I'll also give a shout out to Courtney in the chat. She said, hi, everyone. Lauren is one of my favorites. Also, what are you drinking? It looks tasty. <laughs> Which it sounds Would you like, like to know? <laughs> yeah. uh, I can tell you that on my actual first anniversary, maybe it was the day before. Anyway, we got a bottle of Snoop Dogg champagne. And it was so bad, you guys, so bad. I will drink pretty much anything. And like, I could not kill this. Um, so I made a champagne simple syrup. And then I was like, cool, what the hell do I do with this? And I Googled, what the hell do I do with this? Um, and it suggested uh, champagne simple syrup, lime juice, and rum. And it kind of tastes like, you know, the, the daiquiri ice flavor from Baskin Robbins? No. <laughs> I can't what? Say I do. I'm a Baskin okay. Robbins lover, but I always go to the same like chocolate or cookies or. Well, anyway, it tastes a little bit like the Baskin Robbins uh, 
daiquiri ice flavor, but also can we talk about my redneck wine glass, which P.S. is a horse show prize. Uh, I like it. Thank you. Cheers. It's a mason jar with a stem. Anyone who's listening. Ex- yeah. Oh, listening. oh yeah. This is audible. Yes. Mason jar with a stem. It's great. Anyway, there's a lid for it too. So two plugs I also want Sorry. to do. <laughs> One is to Lauren. Lauren, you did a hack chat on how you memorize your dressage chest. So anyone can look that up in the, t- in the Red IQ app. And then is your coach Jackie Brooks or do you work with somebody else? I work with somebody else. I work with Allie Brock, um, but Jackie Brooks is like the coolest person ever. Okay, I want to well, be Jackie Brooks when I grow up. That's where my plug was going to go. Cause we do have a Jackie Brooks track on the app, which is an in stride episode with Sinead. I believe Kinsey or well, not if I'm right. Okay. We're getting a nod. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was all I was going to mention. Kinsey, I believe I I'm due to yield my time to you, but if I can take it too. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're just fighting for the opportunity to ask more questions. Lauren, what is your, what is in your mind, the perfect way to go around the arena prior to your test? Depends on the horse. Um, it certainly depends on the horse, but I can assure you that on no horse, am I just like mm, going around with nothing going on in my brain, usually making transitions, sometimes horses that are a little bit skittish, a little bit nervous, I may be changing the lines of their body. I'm going from shoulder into Ron Bear. I'm going from haunches in to haunches out, which is also Ron Bear. Um, I'm doing things to keep their attention on me. Um, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I love the sound of my own voice probably more than I should. So I'm usually talking to my horse. Uh, my assistant trainer just told me not all that terribly long ago. She said, you talk more when you ride than anyone I know. It's a little bit about my nerves. It's a little bit about, because I talk to my horses all the time because I can't shut up. They're used to hearing the sound of my voice. I want them to be confident when I'm going around. Um, Yeah, I'm doing something. It is not wasted time. Um, I am not superstitious about anything. I know this is not on the list of questions that I was prepared to answer, but I'm gonna ask them anyway, uh, answer it anyway. And that is like, what do I do in the, what's my superstition on show day? I have a little superstition about how I go down the center line. As I'm coming around, the bell is rung. I'm turning up the center line. I say out loud to my horse, okay, horsey, today we're going to do three things. And I think about those. I I say to him those three things. So I'm going down center line and puck imminently. I'm going to say, okay, puck, pull the highest point. Your half halts are going to work all the time, not some of the time. (laughs) And... I'm going to think about keeping you narrow between my knees. And then I say, stay with me. Here we go. And that's how I go down the center line. That is how I've gone down the center line on every horse I've ever ridden at basically any level since I was a teenager. Intentions, guys. I just got chills at that. I'm like, there needs to be a documentary on this woman. (laughs) It would be so boring, you guys. (laughs) It would not. (laughs) Also, like, I am I know people have picked up on this, but you are the world's best interviewee because no matter <laughs> how much Kinsey and I drop the ball, one, you can answer the question and find something helpful to tell us, or you can, without putting the spotlight on, like, okay, that was a stupid question, you can give, a, like, edit the question and give us something of value. So it that thank you for doing that. It really is nice for us. It's um, called media training and a liberal arts degree. Thank you to the USEF for helping with the media training. The liberal arts degree was courtesy of Sarah Lawrence College. Go Griffins. You're I think welcome. I might need the media training. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. One thing that I wanted to dig into a little bit is maybe two movements, maybe three, but understanding what the judge is really looking for in the movement. And I have a movement in mind. It's the free walk. And we can decide what the other movements that we dig into are movement or movements, but in the free walk, will you coach us through what that movement ideally would look like? When are you starting to pick them up? All of the things that kind of help us get our head around what we should actually be doing there. So the first thing I go to is the directives that are written on the test. I don't always abide by the directives of the test because I'm experienced and I sometimes I know better. Um, you're reminding me, Jess, that I forgot to send you the right IQ lesson that I recorded today, which is about 
lengthenings and in which uh, I say yes. you should ignore the directives on the, the test frame. when it comes to lengthenings. <laughs> um, but free walk, which I forgot to record today. So thank you. I'll do that tomorrow. Um, free walk. The command is, and I don't have it in front of me, but it's a free walk is the command is usually about, you know, showing a, a maximum release on a long or loose rein. So those are two options. You can do either. I know of very few horses who are great at like, you come around the corner, drop the reins and say, Jesus, take the wheel, Dobbin, achieve maximum reach. And Dobbin is like, yep, good for, I'm good. Like, here we go. Some horses can. I've never personally owned one of them. They sound delightful. Um, so I'm always thinking about the horse taking my contact down and away from me. Um, I am looking for the walk that looks the best to the judge at C. I am looking for as much swing, relaxation, and ground cover as possible. I am also looking for the walk that is most consistent from letter to letter. And if I'm on some ding dong young horse that is reliable until it's not, you better believe I'm not letting go of the reins. Cause if they're like, I'm stretching, I'm stretching, I'm stretching squirrel. My eight has become a five. Whereas if I keep a little bit of contact and I'm saying, hello, baby, hello, baby, I'm still up here. Then maybe I'm only getting 7.5, but I think that that's still better than the gamble. What, they're, what, the, what the judge is looking for is the longest amount of overtrack, the longest amount of swing, the walk that looks the most straightforward. If you are on a horse that has a big honk and walk, fantastic, that's great for you. If you're not, here's a little ring craft for you. Homework assignment, everybody, everybody get out their pen and paper and I want you to write this down. I want you to go to YouTube when we're done here, not right now, because obviously I'm very important right now. And I want you to watch videos from the World Young Horse Championships. We can have a conversation about whether the World Young Horse Championships are what you should be striving to emulate or not. But the way that those riders ride the walk is phenomenal. Look at their elbows. Whether the horse has a walk for a six or a walk for a 12, the rider's elbows have a tremendous amount of give. It's like hunter riders that are showing horses over like two foot three fences that have the big release that says to the judge, oh, judge, my goodness, look at how much jump this horse has over this teeny tiny fence. It has so much bascule, it's cracking me out of the saddle. When I ride free walk, my elbows are going forward and back, forward and back, forward and back to follow the oscillation of the horse's neck to say, oh, small R judge at, at C, look at how big this horse's walk is. My God, it's practically ripping my elbows out of their sockets. It's so big. Is that theater? Absolutely. Am I lying? You bet. It's six minutes of theater, guys. That's what a dressage test is. It's six minutes of theater. So there's a little ring craft for you. Keep your elbows moving. First of all, you'll get better walk. Second of all, it'll look like better walk, whether it is or not. I just pulled up the Young Horse Championships. I haven't watched these before, but this is fun. And also these sexy horses elbows. are very impressive <laughs> yes. for young horses. Yes. yes. If anybody any has a million dollars that I would that they want to spend on a six-year-old, I can help you do that. Oh, uh, there's the the video I pulled up is three and a half hours long. So this I could definitely get sucked into this. <laughs> Excellent. You're gonna need more red wine. I know. Um a question in chat. Courtney asked or just confirmed. So we should be keeping a contact, but with a stretching neck, ideally. Again, it depends on the horse. If you have a horse that wants to seek the ground, like a bloodhound the entire way across the diagonal, if you just like yeet the reins at them and hold onto the buckle, then mazel tov, but most people don't. Um, so keeping contact is acceptable. That is how free walk it, it may be ridden. It's not the only way it can be ridden, but yes, that is that is an acceptable option. Extended walk is on a contact. You can't go Jesus take the wheel in extended walk. Got it. Um, okay, Courtney said 10-4. Is there another movement that we should narrow in on before? I mean, there's definitely a few more questions that would oh, be great to get to, but so is, there, is there another movement that would be that you kind of think would be helpful to dig into in terms of clarifying what the judge is looking for or how to ride it to have more success. 
I think to cover as many bases as we possibly can here, let's talk about how every dressage test within reason begins and ends. And that is with halting at X and proceeding off. Whether you are entering at, at trot or at canter, what they are looking for is straightness, of course. What they are looking for is a transition at X that is like a feather landing and not like dropping the Titanic's anchor off the back of a ski doo. They are looking for you to put both reins and your whip, if you are riding with a whip, into one hand, doesn't matter which hand. They are looking for you to drop your empty hand to your side, drop your nose to your navel for one second, put your hands back on the reins, take a breath, and then proceed off. Here are some things that they're not looking for. Number one, dropping into the hull like you've dropped the Titanic's anchor off the back of a ski doo. It shouldn't look like a hockey stop. It should look thoughtfully prepared. Second of all, please, God, don't make your salute into like this froofy jazz hands thing. Like, just drop the damn reins and shut up and move on. Nobody cares. Um, don't salute with your whip in your hand. We talked about pet peeves er earlier. That's another one of mine. Put your whip into the hand that is keeping the reins. It doesn't mean that it has to be actually in the hand. I carry my whip in my right hand often. I salute with my right hand almost all the time. So I put the handle of my whip sort of between my, my thumb and my index finger of my opposing hand and then drop the hand that's empty. Um, if you are a person who needs your whip in one specific hand, I can salute with my left hand. If my whip's in my right hand and I don't feel like arguing with it, I'll just salute with my left hand. Nobody cares. Um, they absolutely care, or at least I will care and spit at you if you do like the froofy, I'm going to like jazz hands and twirl my hand in the air. You just look like a doofus. Um, if you are saluting from the canter, prepare your, uh, halting from the canter, excuse me, prepare your transition three strides in advance. Gather, gather more, gather most, release into halt. If you are preparing your transition from the trot, it's very hard to land square promptly out of a two beat gait. So for me, I think about, I'm gonna prepare my trot, uh, my halt transition. I'm gonna sort of think of releasing my halt transition. And then I'm gonna allow each of my horse's feet to move one more time, one, two, three, four. That allows them to square themselves up. Practice square halts, guys. Everyone and their mother has a square halts exercise as an, on ride IQ. I think that I don't actually, so I should get my shit together. Um, and then your transition out should be prompt as soon as you ask. It doesn't mean that your salute has to be a drive-by shooting. Salute. <sighs> okay, trot out. With that said, intro has different requirements. Um, training level, you are allowed to walk into and out of your halt. Do that. <laughs> Think about, you know, allowing your horse to like settle in and gather walk out and trot. If, if you can pull off a quick, like, boom, halt to trot transition, great. Go get yourself some points. If you can't, walk out. And then as far as straightness, don't think, okay, I'm going to be straight at the last minute, because I assure you that is how your horse ends up doing like the cha-cha slide and ending up perpendicular to where you started. Think about a photograph of a road disappearing to a point out on the horizon. Narrow yourself out 30 steps in front of you, 40 steps in front of you. Pick a tree on the neighbor's property behind the judge's booth and think about narrowing yourself, narrowing your horse out to that point. Mic drop. Yeah, you need a break after that. That was, that's a lot. But um, in, in actual practice, do people actually do that with their saluting? Every and now yeah, and I guess if you're listening it. to this, Lauren is doing quite a lot with her hands. Yeah, and I'm really white, so I'm not a good dancer. So you should see it. It's a lot. Um, yeah, every now and then I see one where someone's like, Brrr, and I'm like, whoa, buddy. <laughs> whoa, buddy. Like, keep the jazzercise at home. Just salute and move on. That's awesome. Um, I love that. Now I want to see it. Um, Okay, well, Lauren, this was so unbelievably helpful. Before we, because I know we have a couple minutes here, I wanted just to hear, is there like a dressage test that lives in your brain that you're like, I, that dressage test gave me, like I gave my all to it. 
like it, it everything worked out perfectly do you have an experience like that that like there's one that sticks out to you is like that was my that was a pinnacle so far there's a couple um there was a there was a grand prix test on elvis that was spectacular uh there was a grand prix test on Allegria that was spectacular there was my ride at the USDF finals not last year on Elvis in the Grand Prix freestyle. The, the ride in which I was reserved national champion was for sure one of the highlights of my life because it all worked out. But I think what will provide the most inspiration and a good chuckle to everyone is, our, is two rides uh, that I had at training level last year. I had the great privilege of showing a wonderful Irish horse named Quilder Maud Rowan. He makes an appearance on a couple of Ride IQ lessons. Um, and Rowan is like, man, Rowan was what you wanted to be showing at training level because every step was the same. And he's beautiful. He's big and gray and gorgeous. Um, and I went and I showed him training level and it was fine. It was okay. It was a perfectly nice test. It was lovely. And I came out of the ring and the judge was on the brink of proposing marriage actually it was quite a lot um not really but anyway i got out and i got my score sheet back and it was like a 77 it was something totally disgusting and i called his owner and i was like listen i have good news which is that your horse has won the class on a 77 and i have bad news which is that it was not deserved it was good, but it was not that good. So I just want you to know that at some point in my life with this horse, karma is going to come a calling. So I want you to be prepared for it. Like, I just want to temper your expectations. The next day, I Babe Ruth it. Man, like, there is the outfield out of the park. It is the best training level test I've ever ridden. It is gorgeous. And I halt and salute. And I'm like, mm, 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 I'm going to get an 80 on this. I've never gotten an 80. It sounds like fun. And I go back to the barn and I pick up my test and it's like a 66 or something like that. And I had to call the owner and be like, remember how I talked about karma? <laughs> and remember how I said it wouldn't be instant? Surprise! It came back the very next day. So remember that the number of times that you are screwed with your pants on and the number of times that you get a Christmas present will equal out over the course of your life, sometimes in the same weekend, which is hilarious. But sometimes it will not be in the same weekend. Remember that the only person whose opinion matters is yours you get to decide whether you're happy or not you get to decide whether you had a good time or not and when all else fails i choose happiness simply because life is easier that way there's plenty of hard that i can't control i might as well choose happiness when i can so remember that you are having a wonderful time at a in a venue full of predators a prey animal is letting you teach it how to dance how privileged are we? Choose to be happy about that. And when all else fails, I scream margaritas or both. She has a way with words, folks. It's incredible. <laughs> we need to come up with something like a graduating class of Ride IQ and, and, and have a commencement speaker because you are it. <laughs> if we can get you. Um, well, Lauren, this was amazing. We got tips about everything from grilling to to warm up to etiquette and not looking silly um thank you so much for sharing your insight with us like you really are such a thoughtful person and horse person and rider and you, the way that you communicate all of what you've learned is i mean it's fun and also just so helpful so thank you again for just lending your brain to us for your brain and your time to us for an hour I love you too, man. <laughs> um, all right. Well, say hi to Puck for us, Cadeau for us, Skylar for us, the whole oh, gang. Yeah. <laughs> um, we really appreciate you. And we also appreciate everyone who tunes in and, and chats or asks questions. It's really fun. And um, I just put a video of a free walk from the Young Horse Championships in Facebook. And it definitely follows what you said people were going for there <laughs> there's some sexy elbows you guys there's sexy theatrics. elbows all right well lauren we'll get we'll let you get back to your grilled chicken and your evening and thank you again cheers y'all